Good day there, this is Joe Van Cleve and welcome to another episode of the Typewriter video series and I have a special guest today, my friend Kevin Kittle from Albuquerque, a fellow typewriter enthusiast and fellow conspirator and the last two Albuquerque type-ins that we've had. Welcome Kevin to the show. Thank you very much. Um, I was going to have you uh, give us a brief a little rundown of your background in typewriters. How did you get into typewriters? Well, like a lot of us, when I was, uh, I grew up when my parents had a uh, commercial print shop in a small town, and um, one of the things that I had to do to learn to type was address envelopes for a wow. book that they were selling via mail order. They got the mailing list, and then you had to physically address the envelopes back then, wow. and that's how I learned how to spell Albuquerque, because I got the list that had Albuquerque on it, so yes. I must have typed that <laughs> a thousand times, but it was a pretty good deal. It was a penny per envelope, oh, yeah. so you do 500 envelopes, you know, you right. five bucks. That yeah. was pretty good back yeah. in the, that day. Anyway, so then I got given a uh, typewriter. It was a graduation present. That was what you got. You didn't get a computer. You got no. a typewriter. That's right. And used that through college. And then it kind of developed from there when we lived up in Alaska, and I ended up trading my graduation gift for this really cool um, Underwood Type Master with script type. Oh, so yeah. At that time, I was using the typewriter to write letters to home and stuff like that better. Nice. And so I really loved that script type, and I thought, oh, that was a great deal. And then uh, later on, when we moved to Albuquerque, I came across an Underwood 6 typewriter. I thought, oh, I really need a more official yeah. typeface business one, and it kind of built from there. And that's when I met John Lewis at some point. And then it just kind of... Uh, John Lewis being the local typewriter repairman uh, business systems here in Albuquerque. Right. Yeah. And he was uh, at a different location at that time. So that was, gosh, going on almost 30 years. Wow. And ago. And uh, so then it just kind of built from there and then kind of just started collecting ones. And I thought, oh, I just really like this. And so I would find different typewriters and pick them up. And then I started getting some of the typewriters off eBay before now they're more expensive because yeah. I was able to pick up my Oliver uh, number nine, and I have a Remington number seven, and I oh. picked those up for well under a hundred dollars. So you know, not very much. It sounds to me like you were a typewriter. You were the a formative member of the typosphere, if you will, before there was a typosphere. Like, yeah, because there wasn't any that great right, long. Right, you were like an early. Uh, typewriter enthusiast, if you will. Yeah, and, I, and, and that's when uh, John Lewis, he had his typewriter museum in his business going. Yeah. And, uh, and I would go out and hang out at John Lewis's place, sitting there like on a Saturday afternoon, and some other guy who was at that time quite a bit, even quite a bit older than I, he would hang out, and we'd be talking typewriters and stuff like that. I mean, it was just totally ridiculous. So you were like groupies. It was like a groupie, you know, and I'm thinking, and I've got to think of one, but this is really crazy, but it was really neat because you could yeah. walk around and yeah. go through his museum and you could see all these really different typewriters and all these yeah. different approaches to the same thing. Yes, yes. And it was really pretty fascinating. And, uh, and then I go home and I think, oh, I really want one like that. And that's how I got the Oliver. I thought, I really like that, you know, and it went on from there. So yeah, it's, it's and then it was a little later on, and I got a few of the typewriter books that were out at that time, about, and they were pretty dry as far as enthusiasm, unlike what's out there now has right. this uh, exuberance coming yeah. from, the, from the typewriter, uh, uh, people that write typewriter books. Um, but then it was just, uh, you know, it was just yeah. interesting in the history and right. all that stuff. And, right. And so. It seems like there's, to me, there's two typewriter enthusiast generations. There's yeah. the sort of antique typewriter collectors of old, you know, and they were all into just the ephemera and the history. Yes. And, and then there's the newer enthusiasts who are more like users of typewriters rather than collectors, right. I would say. Like the old style was you, you just had a, a, a shelves and cabinets full of antiques. Of the antique typewriters, yeah. You yeah. saw that in the movie uh, yeah. that, uh, with Tom, uh, Tom Hanks yes, in it, yeah. and had that one particular collector yes. has you know all these antiques on right. the shelves and all that. And then you're right, and then we have this whole other thing, and it seems like the second generation of enthusiasts are sort of like yourself. They like the portable ones, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they like the ideas of using them. Right. And, and, I mean, and the old school uh, collectors would say, well, portables never really 
built that well. Right. They're kind of flimsy. And my light, my take on it is, yeah, that means they're lightweight and you can carry them wherever you want to go. You know, go to coffee shops or cafes or whatever, you know, or just easily carry them out to the patio room or the back porch or whatever. You know, and it's not like you're buying a wonderful mechanical heirloom. Well, the thing is thing. that also, too, in that generation of years, and then I've kind of morphed into that generation yeah. of we want to use the typewriters to write something. Yeah. Yes. Whether it be, yeah. you know, the great American novel or we just address an envelope. Yes. You know, that's yes. all, all we really want to do right. is just is be able to type something. Whereas the, the first generation, they were collecting the machines as artifacts. Yes. Yes. As, as yes. machines. And, and Oh, well, you wouldn't replace the platen on that because it's not original. It's just like collecting antique cars. It's like or antique cars. Yeah, yeah you yeah. want the car to be perfectly original. And there's this conflict between, actually, in cars, it's three. You have, you have the originals right. and the guys that want to make them usable. Yeah. And then you have the guys that want to make them hot rods. Hot rods, like yeah. So yeah. it's like the, the three steps. And, yeah, yeah. And, so, and I guess we have that in typewriters, too, because there's a few people that are They're making hot, hot rods, rods by painting them purple and, purple and, and all, all, all that <laughs> stuff. You know, so it's, it's kind of crazy. Well, so we had a, a type out back in November of 2017, and it was at Penny Smith's paper in the North Valley of Albuquerque, and it was fun. But you brought a machine here. This was new to your collection at that time. Right. But, yeah, and I actually I, it had arrived just a few days before we had the type out. Oh, and, okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, it That's arrived. Right. Like, the type out was on a Sunday, and I think I maybe got it on a Tuesday or Wednesday via DHL, and in, in this box full of uh, styrofoam that was all crushed and everything like that. <laughs> and you were concerned about how I that... was concerned because the typewriter came like it is now, and. Um, you can see the carriage return levels folded back. And oh, I thought, yeah. oh my gosh, it didn't make it through shit. It was broken, all that <laughs> well, stuff. Well, show us how that thing folds. So actually, it's yeah. designed to fold back. So then it's very simple. You pull it forward into its normal position, and it just pops into place. Uh, and so then if you want to go back again, you would just kind of lift it up. So now this is a lift it up. Godridge Prima. Godridge Prima, which was the last model that Godridge made. Which Godridge Tell us is, about Godridge, yeah. Godridge is the uh, manufacturer in India. Ah. And they were the also the last manufacturer to do a full-size manual typewriter. Now, there's ah. still uh, portable typewriters being made in China. I see, yeah. Uh, manual pie typewriters. But Godridge is the last one to make a, I would consider a standard size or a full-size typewriter. And they ended production of these in 2009. I see. Which was pretty amazing. And this is the kind of manual portable you might have seen in videos of people out on the streets doing public typing, so. document typing kind of thing. Document, you see the, yeah, the, yeah. the, the, the Indians sitting there either in a chair or not yeah. on, the, on something and then they're typing and they have all these people that are right outside of a, a courtroom or a, a, a um, government office and they need things typed because yeah. they have to take these papers into the government office for one thing or another right. and so then they end up uh, hiring one of those typists that are sitting there on the street, the street typists. Wow. And they, and they, they would use the, the uh, Godrig. And the whole thing, Godrig started manufacture in the early 50s, and their whole thing was that they wanted to um, compete with Remington. Remington was the big brand in India. Oh. And then also Facet was a big brand in India. Oh. And they wanted to make, because they were a manufacturer of refrigerators and they, uh, other things, so they wanted to make a typewriter that was as good as the Remington. Very good. And so that's what they eventually... So did they borrow them. some design ideas or, or internal They kind ideas? of reverse engineered it. They took a Remington's of the era of the 50s and they kind of reverse engineered it. And they actually, and I didn't write it down, I should have, but they did take, um, I think it was the, starts with wood, a uh, typewriter. I can't Underwood. Remember. Not no, Underwood, no. no. Oh, uh, uh, anyway. Yes. They took that typewriter, which was a... Woodall, not Woodall, probably up to. Anyway, and they took that and they reverse engineered that one. They looked at that and they started because that one was out of copyright, out of patent, ah. and they could take that typewriter and use it as a basis to start designing their own. And that's what they did. Is they Woodstock? Started Woodstock, yes. that's it. That's I had it. to think of hippies and Janis Joplin. Yeah, right. and I'm pretty sure it's the Woodstock that they basically, because it was a uh, fully developed typewriter for itself, um, but it was a defunct brand. So I they, see. I see. So, yeah. So, they, so there was no patent of the design. Right. So they yeah. reverse engineered it for a, and then started and then redesigned it and then came out with their own. And as they developed it, what they the biggest thing that they, that they had the customers didn't like was that it had a heavy touch. Uh, 
and the typewriter itself was heavy. And so it took a long time for them to develop that. It was all through. And they ran from the 50s up to 2009. And it wasn't until they finally got into the 80s that they developed the typewriter that was competitive to Remington. That was oh, as good okay. as a Remington. Oh, okay. Interesting. And then, and yeah. then they... Uh, but by then, Remington was making electrics, I guess. They were making electrics, but they were still pretty big in India. Oh, were they? Okay. Yeah. And then they outlasted Remington and Facet as they shut down their operations. Godwig still kept making the typewriters and stuff like that. Oh, and their big deal was as because Godwig actually didn't sell as many as other companies. Their big deal was they wanted to... Um, break the 50,000 per year mark. Uh -huh. oh. And it took them a while. They finally were breaking the 50,000. I think they got up to one point to like 75,000 per year. Nice. And, um, and the Prima, which stands for Prima Donna, that's where they got the name I from, see. Um, came out and in the 80s. And they uh, was kind of like the last design that they did. Uh -huh. The, um, it's kind of interesting we're talking about weight because you know when you look at those uh, uh, street typists and they're using the full size yeah, typewriters yeah. and they're having to lug those oh, around. Oh yeah, and all that's that stuff. serious. And so they actually tried to make this little typewriter lighter, so it's kind of like aluminum cast on, the, see, on the body right, and all that stuff. Right. But what's ironic is that I, I weighed it, and this one, which felt lighter, just because of our perception, oh, it's got to be lighter because they say it's going to be lighter. Well, it was 33 pounds even. Oh. But my Underwood 6, which is like the Underwood 5, is 32.2 pounds. So they're very close. They're very close. Yeah, and then you, yeah. know, you go to the IBM Selectric, the, main, the standard model that came out in the 60s, not the later ones, and it was 34.4 pounds. Oh, yeah. But then you go all the way back to my 1919 Oliver, and it's the heaviest in oh. its case, and it weighs 38.4 pounds. No kidding, really? Yeah, so it's luggable. And wow, definitely. literally luggable. And then yeah. you go to your, your the other ones that I weighed because I was curious, um, when you get into the portables, comparing to this, because they yeah. made, basically made this kind of a portable uh, with the folding carriage uh, return lever, um, the Remington Quiet Rider, yes, in its case is 20.8 pounds, and the Smith Corona Electric Portable, yeah. in its case, is 23 pounds. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then, the, of course, the lightest and one I have, the Ultra Portable, the Olivetti. Uh, letter, letter 22, 22. Yeah, yeah. 11.2 pounds. Oh, you see, there it is. A big difference. <laughs> yeah. I wonder what the Hermes rocket would weigh. You know, it's. Uh, yeah, the, 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 it, it, nothing. <laughs> nothing comparatively. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Well, uh, this is a cool typewriter. Do you uh, find yourself using it yet? Have you had a chance to I use it? I haven't really used it yet. Um, as we mentioned during the type out, I, I mentioned that it, uh, the approach on some uh, technicians on how they refurbish these, because <laughs> yeah. this was supposed to be all refurbished when I got it, and I was yeah. trying to get a later model one, but now looking at the serial number, I'm thinking this might be an earlier model, I mean yeah. earlier production, because uh -huh. the serial number is only 9279, the best that I can determine. I see. Yeah. And um, so I'm thinking it's from the uh, late to mid 80s. I see. And Do you think some of the parts have been repainted? It looks like, or is no, it? I think this is all original yeah, finish. Yeah. Uh, it's a definitely a, that that rough finish yeah. they had on it. I noticed the little scale on the bale is pretty worn. This thing has gone through a lot of work. A yeah. lot of work, yeah. This, yeah. And this uh, the scale part of the paper bale actually is held on with two screws. And when I got it, it was upside down, <laughs> oh, okay. so I had to reverse it. <laughs> yeah. But it's really had. You can see where somebody is just. Maybe it's just the the way they grab it or whatever. And you wonder if if they didn't just piece it together with a with a part out of another pile of time. It could very well you know, be. Like you, we have to get this ready to ship to this bloke in America. Exactly. You know, and so they just grabbed a paper scale out of a pile and threw it in there. And didn't notice it was upside down or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm thinking that you're exactly right. You know, because like the, on here the the, uh, the the all the key tops match and they have this textured feel to them. Oh yes. Except for the letter D. Oh, yes, yes. And yeah. the letter D looks like it came from a different typewriter. And it also looks like it has the, the uh, female fingernail uh, groove that comes from a female typist with long fingernails. Yeah, it does, because it's got There's a little, rotation. Yeah, and the others don't. So it's almost like the keycap was probably replaced at yeah. one time. Yeah, at one point. You know, and, and why would the D get broken? Like, who knows? But Who knows, exactly. And so... Um, it's an interesting keyboard, though. So you have... Um, it looks kind of like similar to a British keyboard. It has, and, and this is an English keyboard, of course, yes. English is the dominant language. And they made these uh, in a whole variety of, of uh, uh, dialects in languages. Uh, Hindi, um, and they, in the book that I have that talks about the Indian, type, uh, Indian typewriters, mentions a variety of languages. But this one here, 
being an English keyboard, the interesting characters it has above the five, it has the pound symbol for yes. the English pound. Yes. But they also have off to the right a dollar sign. Yes. That's and then right. above the dollar sign, they have is what's called a section symbol, ah. which you don't see on very many typewriters at all. That's true. And then also, but if you drop down to the right of the L and the uh, semicolon and colon, is the rupee symbol, which is a, uh, yeah. a uppercase R and a lowercase la S. Oh, in interesting. One, th one, uh, and then a fraction, a one over slash fraction. Right, the way they did yeah. fraction, you have yeah. a one over and then you add whatever number and you want. And that makes to. a lot of sense. Instead yeah. of having all these separate fraction keys, right? Yeah, it does look kind of odd, though, because the, oh, yeah. the one is. is, is, is uh, a small one, and then the, the second oh, number is yes, pretty large. Yes, it's a little bit bigger, yeah. And then, uh, but they did have, like, the other ones that I think are interesting, the additional keys. They have the number symbol, N-O, with a couple of lines under it. Right. And then they also have, in addition to the uh, back slant, or backslash, they have a vertical slash. Oh, yeah, that's, you didn't see that until later. In later the, on, Later yeah. on, yeah. And, and, then, and then the other one that I think is really interesting, and I don't know what you would call it, but it is a vertical pattern of dots. Oh, it's almost like when you see a check uh, right. being uh, canceled out from right. a bank when they cancel out those little dot patterns. Yeah, because you can read, if you type on it and you put that on it, you can read the type fine. It doesn't really block the letter, yeah, yeah. but it makes a shading. It's like a shading ah, key for shading. That's very interesting. Which is really kind of interesting. And then the other key that doesn't seem like it does anything at all is actually a anti-jam key. Oh, so if you, so with the type R's, you get them jammed in there. Yeah. You don't have to reach in with right. your hand on that. You just press that in. And, and it does have the uh, exclamation mark. I see also. Right, and yeah. your dash is down low uh, to the right of the period and the exclamation mark. So a few things are in different spots. Yeah. You have to kind of get used to yeah. question mark. You don't have to capitalize for it's way to the right. Because we question everything. Because we question everything, yes. Yeah, yeah. I noticed that on one of my British keyboarded uh, letter of 22s, the same way, the question mark was lowercase. Whereas with American keyboards, it's a shifted character. It's a shifted character. You know? yeah. And I always thought, huh, is that, so, is there something about British culture versus American culture? You know, we could get into that, but. Yeah, they, they, know, they, they use the question mark, I think, more often yeah, than we do. Yeah. yeah, I like that idea. So, And then, then, and, and then just going on about this particular typewriter, uh, this size here is 11-inch carriage, which I wanted. Um, they make them in bigger carriages, but there's two reasons I wanted. I want 11-inch carriage because I think that's the smallest that they made, but also then with our 8.5 by 11 sheets of paper, you can turn it in there and you can do work on it, which is fine. But what they call this size is they call it fullscape. Oh. They actually are using the old paper sizes from the British, so it's it's actually it's a fullscape folio, and and where that comes from is um, the fo full size folio sheet was uh, seventeen by thirteen and a half inches, and then this is half of that. Half of that, okay. And that and depending on the manufacturer of the paper now, you can get that size to a certain degree. And it varies depending on who's making the paper that it may be eight and a half by thirteen and a half, it may be as small as eight by thirteen. Oh. And then what I actually have is from Southworth paper, which is this is a you can't buy it new, but you can buy it off eBay. Um, is this erase and they call it race erase bond. Oh, erasable bond. It's erasable bond, it's twenty five percent cotton, so it's a nice paper and then it has a coating, makes it very easy to erase. Oh, well, and it actually works well. Yeah. It is actually eight and a half by thirteen. Oh. And that's not A3 size. That's, no. That's full scape. That's full scape. And like I said, there's a little uh, variation on that. Interesting. And, yet it's, and they sometimes they'll even go, if you go at 8.5 by 14, what we consider a uh, um, legal, legal size. size. Yeah. Um, sometimes that'll get called full scape, depending on what country you're talking about. It's kind of very, pretty interesting how they do that. Yeah. But the other size carriages they had, you had 15 inch carriage, which they called briefs, brief <laughs> size. And then you had 8.5 inch carriage, which was for policies. Policies. You know, so it's kind of interesting. Policies, briefs, and fullscape. And fullscape. Yeah, and, I, and of course I like the word fullscape. You yeah, know, yeah. It's just a nice, nice term. Yeah, it, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's very cool. What do you think about the impressions of typing on this machine? It's interesting. Um, it has a feel of, kind of feels kind of dead when you, you, you hit it. It doesn't have that, that springiness like the Underwood portable that you have yeah. that has that really nice mm -hmm. bouncy spring feel and all that stuff. My Underwood Type Master, which we mentioned earlier, has kind of a dead feel in the, that, but it's not quite 
the same. This here, it's almost like you hit the bottom of the key and it stops. Uh, but then when you start to type with it, you're thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to be heavy. And then you realize after you type for a little bit, it's not that heavy, and it actually works pretty well. Oh, well. And it's kind of surprising about that. Um, well, I think I'm going to have to try it out here. Yeah, so here we ah. go. We talked about the Foolscape paper. Yes, so yes. there's that. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, look at that. Southward. And it has the uh, bond. Uh, you probably can't see it on paper. Yeah, it has a kind of a glossy texture. It almost reminds me of... It's not exactly like it, but it reminds me of the dryer sheets. Yeah. You know, there's kind of a slickness to the fibers. Yeah, there's a tech, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. What and the of all the erasable papers that I've tried, which is a few, this one surprisingly works pretty well. You use a, a typewriter eraser, and but you don't have to be try to erase it with the uh, uh, crumbling yeah. typewriter stuff. Yeah. You just kind of do it, and it kind of picks yeah. up the ink right off oh, of it. Wow. And then, yeah, and then it doesn't seem to smear after that. Wow, actually it does, yeah, it has a nice feel, pretty good feel, actually, surprisingly yeah, good. Surprisingly for what, what, you, what you would think when you, 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 right. when you first start with it. It has a, a slightly uh, heavy touch to it, but it's not bad, I would say... Um, and you can adjust that by popping oh. this off. It does have an adjustable, so this is where the whole cover comes off. Oh. And so here's your. Now I have oh, it at set. And minus, lines. right? And would I, do I dare try the heaviest? Sure, give it a try. <laughs> okay. Yes. And I'm not sure if there's a whole lot of difference or not. Unjammer. Unjammer. Yeah. And backspace. Yeah, it, there's not a whole lot of difference between the, the touch, and I found that to be true with a lot of machines. And it probably has something to do with the touch control is like just pulling on some bar and pulling on with increased spring tension on something. And right. if all those linkages are, are hardened up with old grease, it's already tense. Yeah. You know what I mean? So. And this one, like we said, because the servicing on this one here from the typewriter yeah. uh, place in India, uh, their servicing was basically, we're just going to oil the heck out of it. Right. And they didn't clean it or anything, so it's got a nice layer of grime and dirt and, and debris. Uh, but it is oiled well, so nothing sticks or anything like that. But it needs a really good cleaning. I'm, I'm actually surprised at how dark the uh, imprint is on this uh, erasable bond paper. Yeah, and that was something, too, and I'm going to put you back on light. Yes, yes. That was something, too. When I first got this, and you, the God rig spools look almost like regular standard spools, but they're not. They're oh, just slightly different. Really? A little different size. And I see they are God rig branded. No, oh, God rig branded, oh. and they're a little bit taller. Oh. And um, so it actually would take a, either a 9 16 ribbon or possibly even a 5 8 because if you put the... Uh, touch control on the ribbon selector, you can actually get it so that you're out, off of this half inch ribbon. So oh, okay. Because it's now you have four different positions on the on the ribbon, like bike on the, it's not bichrome, it's trichrome. I trichrome think. in a way, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you have stencil was one of them, so it doesn't have any ribbon at all. Okay. And then you have like on the I believe it's the Hermes or maybe even the Olympias where they actually had um, the middle. three positions, a middle position so that you could use more of a single color ribbon as right. far as making the ribbon last longer. And when I got this, you're talking about a dark imprint. This one came from uh, with a ribbon from India on it, but it was one of those ribbons that was so heavily inked right. that it, it actually made the letters look blurry. Oh, really? And so I changed it to a, a regular standard uh, medium ink, I guess you would call it, ribbon that I had. Um, and But their ribbon that they sent to was only half inch. It wasn't a 916. So if huh. you were to use like uh, an IBM Selectric original cloth ribbon, it's 916. And I have one of those in my Oliver because it takes a wider ribbon also. Or you can, if you do some searching, uh, find out the... Uh, um, uh, a 9 16 or a 5 uh, eighths oh. ribbon if you do some searching around. So it looks like if you put it to the top edge of the ribbon, it, it is, has some shading and also doesn't have a very good imprint. Yeah, that and, must be the top edge that is yeah, hitting and then, and then the, um, yeah, the bottom, which would be like the red color, if you will, the bottom of the ribbon, it has the, the really good imprint. But, of course, the, when you do it, when you type on the bottom, you're, 
you know, the ribbon vibrator has to travel further. Right. So it might slow the action down, right? Of, if you're well, really how does it work then on the middle one? Uh, the middle one, oh yeah, the middle one. Actually, good. If I could type properly, no, actually the middle one, it does really well. You don't have any shading and it, it imprint is fine and yeah, it's a little quicker. Yeah. I think. Yeah, the middle, that's good. Yeah, that works, that works pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So an interesting ribbon, you know, that's uh, spools. It's, it's yeah, non-standard. It's non-standard. So you have to fun. hope that you don't break these plastic spools, right? Fortunately, they sent me a whole other ribbon, oh, which is one of those really heavy inked ribbons yeah. with a set of spools. So oh, I have okay. a, uh, extra set of spools with yeah, it, which is pretty cool. nice. You know, we were joking. When you brought this typewriter to the type out in November, uh, I was joking saying, I bet you could smell the curry and the spices <laughs> in it or something. But all you can smell is machine oil, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's like that, that blasted oil. Yeah. You know, and there's just, actually a little bit of that mildew smell from the tropics. Yeah, you know, kind of the place. Yeah, that has yeah, yeah. It has a little bit. I can smell. I know that. You know how funny uh, odors can bring back memories. I could, that brought back memories of, of the Orient when I was in the service. Right. That was very interesting. Look and, at this ribbon reversing mechanism. Isn't that cool? And then this bar here is your type jam. Button. Oh yes, yeah. So it's just pushing back all the all the linkages at once. Yeah, it works surprisingly well. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I look at the construction of this. The frame on the bearings of the carriage. I mean, that thing is like, my gosh, that's like cast. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Pretty, it's, a, it's really solid made. It's funny because they really took that in in the the book about uh, India typewriters. That uh, which I, book is it? If you can, uh, it's uh, with. With great, great truth and regard, and it is by the story of the typewriter in India, edited by Siddhartha Bhatia. Yeah, and it's, wow. a, it's nice. It's a recent publication, so it was oh. done within the last few years, and um, they basically it's published by Godring. Oh, okay. Oh, Rolly Rolly books, books. Yeah. And they basically celebrate the typewriter in India here. They they oh, go over all kinds of beautiful. social aspects as well yeah. as manufacture. And it's quite interesting because also it turns out just as a side comment that India was one of the last, and they may still be, the only type manufacturer for typewriters for the Chinese. Oh. There was a company that started making type for the typewriters, and they almost didn't survive. And then when Olympia decided to get out of that business, they did survive, and they were sending type to China. Wow. And they may be the only ones that are doing it. Because you have to have special tooling and stuff to make right. that type of thing. Wow, I did not know that. Well, this is fascinating. It really is. Yeah, and then and, and this they talk about the heavy duty construction of these, right? And they talk about because the uh, they did incorporate from East Germany when they were designing these in the '60s. They went to what's called Burrow Machine Werk, ah. out of East Germany, and they're the ones that made the Optima typewriter. Oh, okay. So they got engineers and expertise from them to help them develop their typewriters. Oh. And so. Basically, and then one of the so there's a little bit of Underwood, a little bit of Optima, a little bit of uh, uh, Woodstock, Woodstock. You yeah. know, trying to compete with Remington yeah. and all that as they build things up. And the uh, interesting thing about it is they they talk about how these were made in heavy duty, durable in an East German way. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, before the uh, Iron yeah. Curtain came down. Okay, so we're going to look at how you remove the whole carriage assembly on the Godrige Prima. Go ahead and show us. Yeah, I and mean, what it is, it's really simple, which is kind of neat for servicing and cleaning. You would fold back the carriage return level like we see before to get out of the way. And then at this point, you pull off the cover for the ribbon spools. And then the only other thing that's kind of odd that you have to do, and I guess it's not really odd, but you have to slide it to one side and you want to loosen this little back cover plate screw so that you can slide it that and then you do the same with the other side and with just a regular slotted screwdriver loosen that up and that allows you then to pull this back cover off easily so that it's out of the way and then you reach inside here by the ribbon pulls and there's just these levers you pull them forward and go click click and it comes off Oh man! And so there, it's very simple, and you know, just uh, and you can see the whole mechanism. And uh, of course, as we talked about, it's quite dirty, but uh, all the gears and everything. And the reason they did that is because you use the same frame of the typewriter, but then you could change carriages for your different size carriages. Oh, sweet! So it worked really well. And then putting it back together is pretty much the same thing. You just kind of have to look at it, line things up to make sure there's a couple of 
holes right here that pins go into, so you know you're lined up right. Ah, very cool. And you just have to kind of look in there. It looks like it fell into place pretty well. And then you just press the same thing. You press these levers, you release them. They have the little releases, so now it's locked into place. And then you would do the uh, back cover, slide that back in under the screws there. I will skip that for the moment because you kind of have to pull the washers up. And then put your typewriter ribbon cover back on. Sweet. And you're ready to go. Sweet. Thank you. This was a fascinating conversation, and I'm glad uh, the, to have you as a guest on here on the, on the show, and I hope that we can see more of you and Kevin in the future as uh, we talk more about typewriters. And I uh, hope you guys enjoyed our guest, Kevin Kittle from Albuquerque. And until next time, you guys have yourselves a great day.